Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Um, I've got the dry agers going, uh, drying beef, and I've already got some whole muscle uh, dry cured meats going in the smaller one. And I'm gonna start making dry cured salamis today. And I'm gonna start out with something that is uh, fairly simple, just a picante salami. So in this bin, I have partially frozen pork and I have 80% lean and 20% fat. So let's get it into the grinder and get moving. Okay, so the meat has been ground. There's a tiny little bit of meat in the hopper here that hasn't gone through the plate yet. Everyone tells me about the bread trick. I take some of the already ground meat and just put it through a second time. It's not gonna be ground any finer going through that same plate, but it will push the unground stuff through and it'll leave a little bit of ground meat in here that I can pull out as I clean out the machine. So we're fully ground at this point. I turn the machine off. I'm gonna put the ground meat back in the fridge and keep it cold while I assemble all of the spices and the mixer. See you in a moment. Now the first thing we need to get ready is the starter culture. These are a fermented sausage and the fermenting does a couple of things for us. It, um, it produces flavor, fermentation produces flavor, but also uh, the particular bacteria that is usually in the uh, sausage starters and there's many of them. Um, I'm using something called Mondo Start, but there's lots of different starters. And depending on where you are, get the one that's available to you. Um, I'm going to eventually explore all of them because I understand each of them will bring a different flavor. But they also, during fermentation, drop the pH or change the pH in a way that it makes the sausage more acidic. And the more acidic the sausage is, the less chance of having bad bacteria start to grow. So it's also a safety measure. And then I'm gonna mix it with distilled water. And you wanna use distilled water or bottled water, not tap water. Uh, just a second, let me measure this out. And I know there's a lot of people right now typing in the comment section about chlorine and how to get rid of chlorine in your tap water. Um, and the chlorine would kill or might kill the bacteria that we're trying to grow here. So you don't want that to happen. Um, problem is, most municipalities in North America stopped using chlorine quite a while ago. And they now use a different chemical called chloramine. It's related, but different, and it's persistent. Um, you can't boil it off. You can't leave it out on the counter overnight and let it off gas. It stays around. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they started using it, because they could use less and still make the drinking water safe longer. So the only way to get rid of it is, uh, there's another chemical process that I use down in the brewery when I, when I brew beer. Just get yourself some distilled water. You wanna make sure that this starter culture is growing if you're gonna go through all of that trouble. Another part of this is, a lot of people say you don't need this, that there should be enough good bacteria on the meat already, that it will start fermenting on its own. I think for my first few times out, I'm not gonna go down that road. Um, I think from my first few times out, I want to start with something that I know is going to taste really good and is going to be safe. Okay, now to get the rest of the ingredients out. Okay, everything's laid out here. I'm going to use a stand mixer to mix up the meat. You could do this by hand if you wanted to. You could do it with a hand mixer. Um, pretty much you want to almost emulsify the meat, make it really sticky, and the stand mixer does this quickly, um, quickly and easily. And it's also great at incorporating in all of the flavorings and getting them completely distributed. So I'll get the meat into the bowl and then we'll get the bowl onto the stand mixer. And of course, I'll try not to spill everywhere, but you know, I'm bound to. Okay. Onto the mixer with the paddle attachment and we'll mix this together for two or three minutes before we start adding the spices. Okay, the meat's starting to come together. It's getting a little bit sticky. Um, I'm at the maximum of what this mixer will handle though. So first in are some red pepper flakes. It is called picante after all. Next, black pepper and some crushed fennel seed. And um, I've just crushed it in mortar and pestle. There are still some whole kernels of fennel in there. I've got some crushed garlic and I could have crushed that garlic in with the meat um, actually in the grinder. That's probably a great way to do it. Next I have salt. 
Salt is for flavoring, but it's also for curing the meat. Next in is dextrose, and dextrose is a simple sugar. It's not going to make it sweet, but it is going to feed the bacteria in the fermentation process. And then this is prog powder number two, or cure number two. And the cure number two, or prog powder number two, is there for safety. It, it's going to inhibit the growth of bad bacteria. A lot of people say it's not strictly necessary. I'm going to use it um, at this stage in my journey of making fermented sausages. I think it's a necessity for safety. Next in is some red wine. And uh, be careful it doesn't slop everywhere. And last in is our starter culture. Now the pork is looking really sticky, so it's not gonna be much longer and we'll be able to take it out. Okay, I think that's mixed enough. It's looking pretty sticky and emulsified. Yeah, this looks really good. So I'm gonna transfer this back to this other container and stick it back in the fridge while I get the casings and the stuffer ready. Yeah. <coughs> That texture is looking really good. Okay. Now I'm filming five sausage videos all in a row today. And the stuffing part of the sausage process is exactly the same for all five of these sausages. So I'm only gonna film it once. So if you've already seen this, you can skip ahead. I'll put uh, chapter markers on the playhead down below. For stuffing these sausages, I'm going to use this stuffer, which is probably overkill for the amount of meat that I'm making today. And I'm using both a natural beef bung and a man-made or synthetic. And the synthetic one is, uh, is really easy to use and I don't see a problem with them. They're very easy to store and care for. But in both cases, it's really simple, similar idea. The natural casings, you need to rinse them and rinse them four or five times, keep changing the water and let them soak. They come salted and they stink. They're not terribly pleasant. But by the time you've soaked them, the smell has gone. Um, the synthetic ones, you just have to soak them long enough that they're pliable. You don't really have to change the water at all. And they're much easier to store because they're just dry. You can leave them at room temperature. So I'm gonna fill up the hopper. Now when you're filling up the hopper, you wanna make sure that you get the meat in there tight and that there's no air pockets. Some people will throw it in trying to get rid of the air pockets. I like to just put it in and really squeeze it down and make sure that it's tamped together. Uh, find a way that works for you. It, you're gonna figure it out. And I crank the handle down just until the meat is coming to the end of the horn. Now, this is one of the beef bungs. Totally cleaned up. Just slide it on. And they come already tied at one end with a bubble knot. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to do much at all. And we'll just fill that up. And that's probably enough because we need we need to have some here at the end to tie a knot. And you want to tie what's called a bubble knot, which essentially means you tie one knot, you fold it over, and you tie another knot so that um, you tie the fold over. Does that make sense? Now, I am not the world's expert at knot tying, so I just do kind of my best. Um, I get better over time, and I'm sure that you will too, so... I tie the first one, and then I tie the second one. And I'm not gonna do a close-up of my fingers because it's not gonna help you. <laughs> really, it's not gonna help you. I am sorry. If you're looking for a knot tying video, um, you better be looking somewhere else. And so that's the first one in a beef bung. And so the second amount from this sausage, I'm gonna do in one of these synthetic and it's the same deal. You just put it on and squeeze it out. I'm going to use that meat that's left in here to test fermentation to see where our pH is at. And after they're stuffed, you want to go around and you want to prick anywhere that it looks like there's a little bit of air. I would err on the side of caution and over prick rather than under prick. Now you want to weigh the sausage 
and write that on a label and tie the label to the sausage just so you can keep track of what it is when you made it, what it weighed, and then you'll know when it's done. Now, bear with me for a moment. I'm over here jammed into the dark part of the studio that you don't actually ever see, somewhere between the sandbags and the power supply. And I've brought my home-built cold smoker into the studio. I'm not smoking these sausages. The next step in a fermented dry cured sausage is to ferment them. I need to have an environment that I can keep relatively moist, um, high humidity, somewhere around 80%, and I need to keep it around 80 degrees Fahrenheit for the next, I don't know, 12 to 24 hours. Some people say to go as far as 48. I don't wanna go that far, and we'll talk about that in the next step, the reasons why. This, I can keep at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I can put a bowl of water in the bottom and keep the humidity up. And so what I've done is I've taken an inkbird from down in the brewery. And the inkbird has a temperature that you set it to. You say, I want this to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And it just essentially, it's dumb. It just switches on and off. And what I've got inside is just a 100 watt light bulb. And so that 100 watt light bulb, after I hang the sausages in, I'll hook it on here. That will keep the inside of this at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So over the next uh, you know, 12 to 24 hours, it'll just cycle on and off and keep a really constant temperature. So I'll hang these sausages up and I will see you tomorrow. Now, about 14 hours have passed since I put the sausages into the curing cabinet. I held them at just over 80 degrees Fahrenheit overnight. Uh, and during that time, that allows the good bacteria or the bacteria starter that we put in to start fermenting, which will lower the pH. And I'm looking for a pH that's somewhere lower than 5.3 uh, at this point. Um, some people say 4.9 is, sh is what you should be shooting for. So I'm going to go somewhere in the middle. I'm going to see what ends up on my pH meter. And this is a pH meter that I use down in the brewery when I'm, when I'm making beer. And it hooks via Bluetooth to my phone. So you'll be able to see what the reading is at the same time. I'll just pull that plastic off and stick this in and see where we end up. Okay, we've got a pH reading of 4.79. That's well within the safe zone. So I'm going to take the sausage to the dry ager for the rest of the process. Now, one more thing before I hang these up in the dry ager, and you don't have to do this. This is completely optional. In this beaker, I have mixed up some distilled water and um, a starter culture for surface mold, a white surface mold that I want to grow on the outside of the sausage. And you don't have to do this. You really don't have to do this. I'm going to put it on because it, it adds flavor is one thing. But it's also um, the kind of thing that if this white mold is growing on the outside already, you're one step closer to stopping bad mold from growing on the outside. So, uh, you can spray it on, you can dip your sausage, I'm gonna brush it on. It's one of those things that, um, just get it on the outside and get it all over. Okay, the smaller dry ager is set up down here in our brewery. Um, it's just getting so crowded out in the, in the cooking studio, I moved it to the brewery. I'm gonna hang these sausages in here with the others. Now the idea is they're gonna hang in here for three, maybe four weeks. Um, time, the amount of time that they hang isn't the important factor. The important factor is you need them to lose around 30% of their weight um, before they're ready. And that sort of determines their doneness. That 30% loss in water weight is what makes them safe without needing to cook them. Now, times, temperatures, and humidities will all be in the description box below the video with the recipe. We'll check in on these in a couple of weeks and look at the mold growth, and I will see you for a tasting when they're done. Okay, a few weeks have gone by, and now it's time to give these a taste. Let's take them out to the studio and see how they are. Okay, let's see. Cut into this one. Okay. 
Hey, Glenn. Hey, friends. Glenn, you're looking a little concerned. I think this is a fail. I think this is a fail. The texture inside, so um, when you grab this, it's squishy it's, and it, it, shouldn't squishy. Be, it shouldn't be squishy. At this point, it should be much harder. And Did you, you not pack it tight enough? I, maybe? I thought I had packed it tight enough. It could be. But yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah. Same with this one. It smells okay. It smells fine. Um, but because I haven't had a lot of experience doing this. We're going to err on caution. I'm going to err on the side of caution and I'm going to set this aside and I will try to make picante again. I'm also going to do a little bit of research and figure out um, what I did wrong. You know what? I'm going to call my friend. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Two Guys in a Cooler. and We've done a collab with him. He does a ton of fermented sausages. So I'm going to consult with him and see what he says. You did I got, get a decent amount of... I got more mold on the outside. I got more mold on the outside and it did dry more than enough. Um, it dried 50%. Yeah. So we had 50% moisture. It's safe. It's definitely safe. It, it's definitely worth asking an expert. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to... So we're not going to taste this one and um, I'm going to ask an expert and so... Maybe we'll taste it next week when they say we're fools. We're fools or <laughs> hang on for a moment and I might do a little addendum and tell you what actually went wrong with this sausage. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon. Hey Glenn, thanks for the email describing the problem you were having with your salami. And you know I love talking about salami, so this was a real treat. The issue that you're facing is something called dry ring. And it's single-handedly the most common problem that people are going to face when making dry cured sausages or whole mussels at home. Dry ring is when the exterior of your salami or whole mussel dries faster than the interior, causing a, a thick outer shell or a dark red ring. Dry ring is caused by too much airflow, not enough humidity, and sometimes temperature. And it generally happens in the drying chamber, but every once in a while, it can happen in the fermentation chamber. So I'm gonna give you a couple troubleshooting tips that will help you identify where your dry ring occurred. If the dry ring occurred during the fermentation stage, that could mean that your humidity was too low or your salami was placed too close to a heating element. If the dry ring occurred during the drying stage inside your drying cabinet, that could possibly mean that your humidity is too low as well or that too much airflow is blowing on top of your salami. All of those situations would cause your salami to dry faster than it should creating that tough outer ring. I hope that helps you find the source of your dry ring so that you could tweak your process and continue making some great charcuterie. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric. I'm the YouTuber over at Two Guys in a Cooler and we have an entire channel dedicated to things like salami, cheese, sausage making, all sorts of cool projects. If you wanna learn anything about that from someone who's slightly obsessive compulsive, we invite you to come check us out. Thanks a lot and Glenn, thanks for having us on. Talk to you soon.